Thank you very much for staying a such a long day. And I really uh, try to provide uh, valuable information to you. ICHM10 is a um, bioanalytical method validation and study sample analysis, which was uh, shared in uh, 2013. And after the adoption of this guideline, there has been a lot of discussion on how we can actually implement this guideline well. And this year, uh, the step five was adopted. And although there are some differences, but still, it is quite clear that uh, we can understand what should be considered more in the bioanalytical method validation and conducting bioanalytical uh, analysis. And as you can see on the slide, many different organizations in the US, EU, and Korea are um, operating the guidelines or the regulations on the method validation for the bioanalytical method. However, as the pharma industry becomes more global, how we can conduct the bioanalytical method uh, development and validation and how we can share the report become much more important. So there was a step to draft the document produced in 2019, and afterwards now we have the step four and five. And as I said before, in developing or doing the global uh, clinical trials, there are certain differences, small differences, but those differences will be harmonized, and that's the intention of this guideline. And for the development of the uh, method and the validation and the concentration result, the reliability of the result in, uh, can be proven and shared by complying with this guideline. So not just the US, but uh, Europe, Korea too, is already sharing the step five updates. So two weeks from now, I believe that the MFDS will share the Korean uh, explanation or the Korean document on the uh, this guideline update. Then what will be the scope? And as you know, it's not just about the clinical studies, but also the non-clinical studies, because the toxicokinetic is really important, and this guideline covers that. And after mandatory submission, the PK data uh, is also needed to be produced and generated based on the validated method. Um, regardless of the step of the uh, phases, the validation for bioanalytical samples are needed. And in the past, there was uh, some cases where the BA was waived. However, now here, the BA and BE uh, conduct are conducted based on this guideline. Whether it's a PK or TK, these are Im included, but also the biomarker guideline is not uh, included. And also immunogenicity is not within the scope of this guideline. And if you look at the guideline itself, there are nine uh, chapters. I believe that there are certain differences or improvement or the strengthened areas compared to the previous M10. LCMS, GCMS are utilized in the analysis method, but M10 guideline focuses on the ligand binding assay related guidelines. Those guidelines are also discussed in this guideline. And cross-validation is also strengthened in this M10. And in case of num number seven, in the genus substances, when the analysis conducted on those substances, what kind of items uh, need to be looked at is also described in number seven and in number eight. How good we are at preparing and conducting the uh, analysis, it is also important to provide a good quality report. So at the end of the guideline, there are many different tables 
It shows that what kind of content need to be included in the validation report and test report and others. So ICH M10 guideline is quite bulky one. So I thought about how I can deliver uh, the details in the guideline in this limited time. So I now categorize my content into three areas. So for the first chapter, we talk about the chromatography and documentation in the chapter 9. Some part of that chapter will be shared during the presentation. And second chapter, we talk about partial validation and cross-validation. I believe LBA may not be explained fully for today because of the time constraint, but I believe that um, in any other cases or occasion, I will uh, be more than happy to explain LBA, but for today, maybe there will be some time limit. Let me talk about chromography first. We are dealing with biosamples. So we cannot just do the analysis through the instrumental uh, instrument, and therefore we need to do the preparation step for the samples. And actually, method development is the one that we put a lot of efforts into. If we are not careful enough for the development of the method, then the sample analysis cannot be well done. Not just the small molecules, but there are many bio drugs. Aptama product and peptide are just a, some of those examples. So the safety issue and absorption issues can be discovered. So all these issues need to be addressed at the method development stage. Otherwise, we can just move to the validation of the method and the sample analysis step. Whether you are the analyst or whether you are the sponsors asking for the analysis, you need to realize that the method development stage is really important. And after the method is developed, then the validation is conducted. Yes, validation of method is important. But many times, uh, the method validation produce a validation report, and then comes the sample analysis. There are many references that we refer to during the method development phase. So during the method development, sometimes we need to spend a lot of time and efforts to do that referencing. and. Actually, the preparation of the reference standards is really important. The uh, reference to produce calibration curve is important, and that's why the purity and identity of the substance is critical. The copy of the COA or the, the table shows the, uh, the information on the substance need to be provided. At the same time, internal standard is equally important. Some people ask me uh, what kind of this, uh, the substance need to be used for the internal standard. Then my answer is always that C13 form or the deuterium of that substance which means that the substance with uh, the similar the physical chemical structure. So there can be variations in the loads during the preparation of phase and therefore the internal standard should play a very important role. So when I review the COA report, the IS or the internal standard is something that I always check for first. So it's really important. And for IS, no impurity and no interference are the assumption. The reference standard requires COA, but the internal standard may not require uh, a COA. So internal standard and the reference standard are used to produce stock solution and working solution. So different uh, zeros have different ways of representing uh, the number, like the two decimal or three decimal. My recommendation is three decimal of effective number. When I say effective number, is something that we can rely upon. 
So here, three significant uh, figures mean the balance and the micropipette stat uh, satisfy these three significant figures for the concentration. So that's really important. So how we can confirm whether the stock solution is well prepared or not? That's one question from the Q&A. Um, actually, we do have the M10 q and A. I I cannot remember uh, what the number for this question, but I remember it was on the page four. For the calibration standard and the QC should be prepared from the separate stock solutions. And when they are compared, and if it's less than 5%, that would be a reliable stock solution. So these stock solution will be used to generate working solution and accuracy and precision. Once they are verified or the validated, validated, then one stock solution can be used for a different many number of the working solutions. So Use, using the working solution, um, the items, as you can see on here, like batch size or the recoveries are something that you remember, but not you cannot see on the slide, but I will explain it later on. So as for the selectivity, selectivity is about potential interfering substances in the biological sample. So, of course, it would be great if you're able to uh, test all different lots, but the guideline says at least six lots need to be tested. Sometimes we may have hemolyzed matrix, but in, even in this condition, uh, whether the sample can be uh, analyzed or not, that's important. Sometimes we may have lipemic matrix, but still, the IS and the sample need to be differentiated. The lateral variation, uh, hemolyzed and lipamic uh, condition need to be applied for the selectivity. Interference, if that category is satisfying or the satisfied, then we need to check whether it can unpack on the uh, the quantification AQC, HQC, different uh, concentration, at least the three different concentrations need to be applied. In the past, like matrix vectors was represented as the concentration in 2013. However, with the Korean translation of the ICHM10, became more clear it is more about concentration, not just the matrix factor. Of course, there are some companies that are utilizing matrix factor, but still here, percent bias per 10 CV meaning the accuracy and precision need to be within the acceptable criteria only then we can conclude and prove that there is no impact on the biological sample. The next one would be the specificity. It's about unknown substance that may have interference if that is for the selectivity but here specificity is about the substance that i know of whether it has the interference with the analyte or not for example metabolite or isomers or any degradation product from the sample preparation so we can utilize blank matrix so that then the highest expected uh, concentration of this uh, substance can be used and then LLOQ peak is compared. And of course, in order to check if there is any impact on the quantification, LQC, HQC uh, need to be also checked. And there are many new drug development activities going on in Korea. In the beginning, we do not know which metabolites are generated from the uh, new drug in the beginning. However, as we move uh, from phase one to two and three, we may encounter with metabolites. So we need to check if there is any back conversion from metabolite to the parent substance. So we need to check e, uh, at least as a post work. So let's say we are done with the selectivity. 
then um, the accuracy and precision are analyzed. But before that, because we need to understand the concentration of the analyte, we need to be able to draw calibration curve. So here, this is the response against the concentration level so that we can understand the relationship between uh, the analyte concentration and analyte area. So at least the six concentration level are needed. And here, it should uh, within the acceptable criteria and should be met for 75% of the calibration standard with a minimum of six. Many times in Korea, we prepare a single calibration curve. However, if you review the overseas data, you can see the replicate calibration curve, which means that at least two sets are used for the calibration curve. On the right side graph, you can see two dots come together to create one equation, although it may not look like a just one dot but if you ask why we need to have like a replicate then i will uh, answer with this slide gcms or the lcms if you have done it you would notice that of course the instrumental analysis can be very consistent however during the analysis uh, sensitivity may decrease or increase or the retention time may change so here one set for the calibration curve is done, and then the QC, the second uh, set. Then within one single run, that kind of the trend can be observed, meaning that we can have more accurate analysis. If we utilize a duplicate, the first set concentration and the second uh, set concentration, both of them need to be within the range. MQL guideline clearly say that more than 50% of the two sets, uh, if they are within the range, then the two sets uh, or the calibration curve from the two sets can be used. And what about the quality control sample? The accuracy and the precision can be determined based on this. Within a uh, run, between run, need to be done within run and between run as you can see here between run it should be more than three runs over two or more days and then the average uh, would be applied so when we start the validation for the method the calibration curve and the concentration of the qc would be the uh, questions that always uh, become a difficulty low qc LLO Q, uh, compared to LLO Q, it's within three times of the LLO Q. It can be three times, 1.5, so it's lesser than three times. For MQC, around 30 to 50% of the calibration curve range. So it's just some very close to the middle. And for the HQC, higher than 75%. For the QC sample, the must always bracket study samples that when it comes to bracket we understand that as there is a bracket up and down of the study sample but there is one more meaning it also talks about concentration compared to the study sample concentration hqc need to cover uh, the study sample uh, concentrations so what i'm trying to say here is that HQC, if it is too close to 75%, I don't believe that would be a good, uh, a good approach. I believe that by not doing so, we don't have to do the partial validation for the QC later on. And the MFDS guideline in 2013, there was a Lewis, uh, the limit of quantification, but it does not require now between learn here as you can see uh, we do have the average value for the between runs so sensitivity can be uh, assessed with the average for ampa run uh, it may not be that familiar term but ampa run is often uh, mentioned 
The precision speed and accuracy is A are used A and P. So it's for the accuracy and precision. And other than that, non A and P run is the term to uh, refer to the other items except for uh, accuracy and precision. There is no LLOQ level. So it's not about accuracy and precision. As you can see on the right side, there are many different validation items where the concentration need to be measured. So for non-AMP run, calibration curve, in the QC sets here, at least the three concentrations, you can see that. And of course, accept the range, the criteria. I'm, I'm just uh, skipping it because you can find it. Next one is the carryover. Well, it is highlighted in the ICH M10 because when we do the analyte analysis, let's say there is a high concentration, then carryover may impact quite a lot the low uh, concentration. So that's why the carryover is highlighted a lot. So at my organization, when we analyze carryover, the carryover for the blank, uh, blank sample is always checked. In the validation in the past, the carryover was just one uh, item. So our carryover was identified just once. But for the carryover, as uh, analysis goes on, the carryover may accumulate in even in the instrument. And therefore, the, whether it is AMP run or non-AMP run, uh, we need to check the carryover if there is a calibration curve exist. And uh, the overseas here was actually uh, are doing it. So calibration curve, the validation with the calibration curve and the analyte analysis if there is a ULOQ then we check the uh, the blank samples we do the injection of the blank samples so that we can uh, confirm the carry over the next one is the dilution integrity here you can see the Korean translation of the dilution integrity and as I said, two weeks from now, there will be Korean translation uh, for the ICH M10 information. And this Korean translation will be in that Korean translation version of the ICH M10 information sharing document. So not lower than the edit of Q, not higher than URL Q. That would be the uh, appropriate calibration uh, curve or the range. But sometimes it may exceed the URL Q. So even uh, when it is diluted, there is no impact on the analysis. That's the reason for this item is to be conducted. So that might be the reason why this is translated into these uh, Korean words. Like two times, five times, and ten times were relatively fixed for the dilution in the past. However, ICH M10 is not like that. When we do the dil dilution, if we confirm that 20 times is fine, then we it would be okay because if the dilution factor is confirmed, then the dilution factor can be applied to the QC samples. The next one is the stability. So. During the development phase, actually the safety need to be confirmed very well. So here, the preparation, collection of the samples, and after the preparation and during the analysis and the storage, all these steps need to be uh, included into the stability evaluation. So the steady sample conditions need to be well uh, understood. And here, you can see there will be freeze and thaw cycles. And stability for the preparation step is important. And of course, during the storage, yes. And if the samples cannot be analyzed right after the preparation, then the stability after the preparation can provide a more flexibility in the range, in the stock solution and working solution, and their stability need to be well assessed in order to do the pre-preparation. Uh, and here, during the collection of the analyte, we need to check if there is any issue for the stability. So sample collection stability is really empathized at my organization because for pharma companies, 
a lot of money and time are spent on the clinical trials and the TK analysis. So without the analyze stability confirmed, if there is if there uh, the stability of the analyte is not confirmed, then and the next steps started, then the uh, issue would be great. So like the phase one, for example, there can be blood samples, but it also there can be uh, urine samples. The blood samples, it takes about one or two hours to separate plasma for urine, at least the 24 hours or the 48 hours. Uh, there should be the collection of the urine and the transferring to the refrigerators. So there is a, such a process. So during the collection of the samples, there should be no problem or the issues. So test samples and the time zero samples need to be compared so that if there is any uh, differences or not. Low concentration and high concentration, at least three concentration need to be applied. And percent CV, which is the precision, is not higher than 15%. So this is really important. The next is the solution stability. So the analyte, whether it's a stock solution or the working solution, short term and long term, both of them need to be checked. For the internal standard, long and short term for the stock solution are not required. It's okay to check uh, the short term for working solution. So if there is a big change from the working solution and LQC working, HQC working, standard were used for the checking, but now with the M10 uh, guideline, the lowest concentration, the highest concentration of the working solution is applied or utilized to check the stability. So that's the change. Sample collection stability, likewise, fresh and control percentage difference between them, percent CV. The criteria is set in terms of the percent CV and percent difference of mean peak area between test and control. And next one is the uh, matrix uh, stability. Um, the stability of the matrix is really important. So what we do the validation, how we design it is actually deciding uh, the result. So I will just explain a little bit more. For the control uh, samples or the matrix, the CRS may have different ways to generate the stability uh, sample for the biological matrix. When the samples are received at the CRO, most of them are frozen. So the process starts from the frozen samples. So the control that we define is stored in the freezer for longer than 24 hours before use. FT, the short term and long term. So the test samples are prepared uh, meeting the short term and long term stability. Then person bias and person CV will be utilized as the criteria to check the accuracy and precision. And there are many analyses going on on peptide. The peptide is not that stable in the room temperature. So when we are doing in doing the analysis in the bench top, we usually do it at the four Celsius degree condition. So the conditions for the preparation of the samples need to be well checked and at least three hours or six hours, actually three hours are too short. The six hours need to be spent on that. That's a bad. And for the freeze and thaw cycle, we believe the there can be some uh, possibility for the repeat test or the IL and therefore we need to consider at least like four cycles or recommend we recommend five cycles. So when we prepare the test samples, the test samples first need to be frozen and therefore it should be frozen for longer than 12 hours. Then it should be thawed. But the thawing process should be done as if the test samples are the, the study samples are done, like longer than three hours. So when we do the ISR with the study sample, we may not have a uh, fails by doing this or doing this pr uh, procedure or the process repeated on the test samples. And for the combination product or uh, concurrent 
product, the substance should be included in uh, determining the stability for the chemical drugs. Let's say if the stability is confirmed at the minus 20 Celsius degree temperature, then it can be exploratory, explore, uh, extrapolated to the lower temperature. In the past, we had to do it both, like minus 20 Celsius degree and then another uh, temperature point below that. But now it can be extrapolated to the lower temperature. The next one is the process to sample stability. Here, um, it does not have a lot of application. What I'm trying to say is LQC and HQC, at a certain uh, condition, they are uh, stored. Then, on a certain day, this sample is analyzed along with the, L, uh, the QC samples and the tested samples. But calibration standard sample and the QC sample need to be analyzed simultaneously that acquire, that secure uh, the accuracy. But if we are, if we have enough number of the samples, then that would be no use. However, let's say uh, this is the I tier, then we do not have enough samples. So in that case, this, this might be required. So depending on the matrix that we want to analyze, uh, this type of a, a stability may have different level of the utility. What about the re-injection reproducibility? Here, the QC sample, the newly created calibration uh, curve can be utilized to look at the QC sample. But here in re-injection reproducibility, all the samples are uh, injected together. It's quite uh, good in terms of the uh, application because sometimes the instruments may have some function issues. So here we do not have to discard the prepared or the process, the samples. But here, by having the re-injection reproducibility confirmed, we can utilize uh, the process samples within the set uh, range of uh, timeline, like two days. So here you can see AMP run. In the AMP run, the samples whose accuracy and the precision are checked, that is used, but there is no need uh, to check it. LOQ, MQC, HQC, the concentrations are being used. So they are injected in order to look at the accuracy and precision. So by having that, the re-injection reproducibility for a certain number of hours can be obtained and that can be recorded in the report. What about the recovery? You remember that there was no recovery in the, uh, the section, num section names. But M10 has recovery on, I believe, on page 30. The recovery is mentioned somewhere uh, in the section about the endogenous substance. However, I should say the importance of the recovery is not that high or strong. Re what recovery means here is that is there any consistency or the precision during the preparation uh, step? If this is not right, then everything that we just discover discussed may not be correct. So the reason that I have a recovery slide here is because still you can refer to the recovery related uh, guidelines or the uh, recovery related section in the MFDS guideline. So person CV is the criteria and the concentration high, middle, low. So average recovery and the precision of that is checked. But sometimes people may ask, what would be the criteria? One thing in the case that we mentioned is that you can look at the total low, medium, high percent CV for the concentrations. Of course, we can show the precision for the different concentration with the percent CV, but we can also look at the total percent CV of recovery at three levels. So these are the, uh, before we do the analysis, we look at the long-term stability. That would be great. But before we are looking at uh, the long-term stability, we usually start the analysis. Of course, before we submit uh, the uh, document uh, to the regulatory body, of course, the stability for long-term is completed. Here you do 
non-AMP run, uh, use non-AMP run for the sample analysis. Here you can see blank uh, sample and a zero sample and calibration standards and carry over and the QC sample sets. Here you can see some options. Let's say I have more than 300 samples per day. Then uh, two sets of the QC is may not enough. In the case, the duplicate should be like higher than 5% of the number of the samples. And sometimes some unexpected things happen during the analysis. Validation run has been done, and now we stop with the analy analysis. But we prepare the calibration standard, but it does not satisfy the LLOQ. Then we just drop it. Before we drop it, we need to check one thing. The concentration right above LLOQ can be set as the LLOQ if we have like six samples here or the six sample concentration. However, at the same time, plus minus 20% if that is not, plus minus 15% need to be the original criteria, which means that the new lower limit calibration standard will retain its original acceptance criteria uh, plus minus 15%. As I said, if one concentration level is not applicable, that does not mean that we have to change all the calibration standard. And for the dilution factor, I, I already told you that the multiply, like 2, or 5, and 10 dilution factors can be used for one single run. That does not mean that we need to generate 2, 5, 10 dilution control. We just can create like two and ten dilution uh, the controls and to show. And as for the calibration range, there can be some issues. How we establish calibration range before validation? That's one question. But when we look at the analysis, sometimes the range is really narrow. Sometimes there are many uh, samples that are above ULOQ. If that is the case, then you need to refer to the SOP of the CRO rather than just continuing uh, with the analysis. We may reduce or the narrow the calibration range or change the QC concentration and do the partial validation and uh, continue. So for the study sample uh, concentration, we need to check whether the QC is somewhere between the two levels of the concentration of the sample. So in the beginning, I said that there's a lot of description added to the documentation. In terms of documentation, in particular, BA and BE requirements have become much more strict. In phase one or TK tests, unlike those, BA or BE tests have to be run very strictly and everything that's additional is pertaining to BA and BE. So if you take a look here, BA and BE, this is just an example, but not only the past runs, but at the failed runs, the response plot for IS has to be provided, and this has to be included into the report. So each CRO will be preparing accordingly. And in other words, this means that if there are a lot of analytes, if you can't run them all in one day, so if you're going to 10 runs, 12 runs, 20 runs for each run, IS response, whether they're consistent, the regulators will be looking to see whether uh, those are consistently coming up. And next is reanalysis. So the decision criteria and the number of replicates have to be stated clearly in the SOP of each lab. So a reintegration and reanalysis, this is SOPs that regulators often ask to see. So run fails and malfunction of equipment and AQL samples observed above the ULOK, ULOK are things that are often looked at. And reanalysis are done and the result would be determined um, looking at the reanalysis as compared to the initial analysis. So as you can see in BA and BE, it's highlighted 
Values from rejected runs should be included in a separate table and included into the report. So it is clearly stated here for BA and BE studies. Now, reinjection. So I said reinjection of process study samples is going to be very uh, useful because there are some areas where reinjection can take place. So if there's equipment failure, then the reason has to be identified and if it's solved. If uh, it's within the allowed time, then rejection can be applied, and it has to be clearly stated in the report, and re reasons for a reinjection should also be stated. And next, another important point is integration and reintegration of chromatograms. The others are optional, but for BA and BE, the Plasten uh, failed uh, and uh, repeat integration results there should all be included. And lastly, Incurred sample reanalysis. This is to verify the reproducibility and reliability. So this is originally viewed as a uh, item, but it is in, in, included right after the analyte analysis. So it has to be representative of the entire entire sample. Samples for ISR are chosen recommended to be chosen around CMAX and the elimination phase. And then there are ISR fails, so don't be flustered. You have to investigate why this was a failure, and you shouldn't also be complacent that you pass the ISR. You should look at the entire trends. If there's fail, all ISR samples from one subject fail or all ISR samples from one run fail, then this means the investigation is needed. So it is advisable to investigate this further. There might be one outliers uh, that those don't really require further investigation. And for partial invalidation, if there is a analysis method change after the full validation was done, Sometimes partial validation can take place, but partial validation is when there is modification in the uh, test method after full validate validation has done, and so details can be referred to in the slide. And for cross-validation, because we run a lot of global analysis in many countries and many uh, test methods, analytical methods, we might have to use cross-validation. And additional considerations, there are four ways for endogenous molecules. This is how to come up with the calibration uh, curve. In two weeks later, you'll be able to look at, see the details in Korean translation. So to sum up, there isn't much change to the documentation in other areas, but for BA and BE test, all data, all information has to be brought into the report. So that is the main focal point. So I had to wrap up my presentation rather uh, quickly. The M10 guidelines don't deviate very much from what we are used to. There are some minor changes for different countries. This was for the purpose of harmonization across countries. And so what kind of test is run in which country and which regulation regulatory authority is accepting the uh, documents? There should be harmonization. So two weeks later, MFDS will provide Korean translation, and you might review these slides together with the Korean translation. So I was about to deal with ligand binding assays, and I think uh, for in the interest of time, you should probably just read through the slides later on because I covered a lot of detail on the earlier sections. And if you have any questions, you might email me and I will answer, try to answer and respond to those questions to the best of my abilities. I thank you very much.